the one who's staying up latest. I've see I see at least one person who was coming in from Germany. So, oh wow! <laughs> I, I've heard you. You're you're quite popular in Germany. Yeah, I'm like the the David Hasselhoff of authors, like way more popular in Germany than I am in the U.S. <laughs> well, we're we're so excited to have you. Um, so to everyone who's in attendance, uh, I can see someone already submitted a question, so that's great. I am going to be asking uh, Peter some questions, but this is an interactive session, so we highly encourage all of you in the audience, if you have any questions for Peter, uh, please uh, just use the Q&A there, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, when, when did you decide that you wanted to pursue writing fiction full-time as a career, and did you always envision yourself writing in the fantasy genre? Uh, I mean, I... I wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid, uh, since third grade, actually. Um, I wrote a poem in third grade in library class. Um, and uh, the teacher liked it so much that she thought that I had plagiarized it because she didn't think that somebody in third grade could have written something like that. And, and like, I sort of got in trouble that day, but I was so proud of the fact that I had written something that made her think that I had cheated that I felt like, oh, I'm good at this writing thing. That should be my thing. And so I was writing comic books and stories and things like that starting in grade school. Um, but I never really thought I was good enough that I could make it a career. Um, certainly I, I felt very daunted entering into the industry uh, and never thought that it would be a full-time career. And then even when it became one, I kind of felt like all right, I'll do this for two years and then I'll go back to a to a cubicle job somewhere. And it's just been my amazing good fortune that the books have taken off and people have really enjoyed them. And I've gotten to do this for 15 years now. Um, my two year plan as a writer has now lasted me for 15 years. So I am now officially unqualified for any other job. So I have to be doing this from now on. Great. And so did you always kind of think of yourself as like wanting to do fantasy specifically, or have you written in, you've written, you say you've written comic books, but have you ever written things more kind of grounded in reality, or have you always been interested no, in fantasy? Not even a little bit. I, <laughs> I, uh, the first book I ever read was The Hobbit. And um, like the first book that I chose for myself without pictures that wasn't assigned by school was The Hobbit. And I, you know, I always wonder if I had written, if I'd read Sherlock Holmes or, or, you know, some other book, if my whole life would be different, but it was The Hobbit and I fell in love with that book and started reading fantasy, not exclusively, but primarily from then on. And so I always knew that, that if I was going to write professionally, that's what I wanted to do. And so all of my practice novels were epic fantasy novels. Um, I spent a lot of time playing Dungeons and Dragons, which was honing my skills <laughs> as a storyteller and getting me more deeply embedded in the fantasy world. Um, so there was never really a question that I would do anything other than tell stories about people with superpowers and monsters and things like that. Uh, it let, Those skills lent themselves pretty well to comic books, um, but novel writing is my first love and what I really wanted to do. And that's what I focused all of my efforts on when I was an aspiring writer. That's great. Um, before we get too deep into this, I figure maybe we should just spend a moment, if you don't mind, could you just kind of briefly uh, give a, a little taste of, of uh, what your novels are about in that world that you've created in case there are folks in the audience who haven't read your books before? Sure, sure. Um, so The Demon Cycle is a five book series. It is complete, so you can binge it you know, right away without having to, having to wait for the next book to come out. Um, the first book in the series is The Warded Man. Uh, there we go. This is like it's disappearing a little bit. Uh, so that has just been re-released by Delray Books. Um, you can read that book without reading the others and just get a, it has a firm beginning, middle, and an end. You can get a sense of what I am as a writer. But if you like it, there's a much larger story there. Um, the Demon Cycle is set in a world where Demons rise out of the ground at night and basically ravage the land, killing and eating anything, any living thing they can find. Um, and these are magical creatures. They're not really harmed by normal weapons. And so the only way to protect yourself and your family and your home is to put magical symbols called wards uh, around your house, around your 
fields around your property in order to keep the demons out. It's sort of, it's like holding up a cross to a vampire. The demons can't cross over this warding net if you draw them properly. But if something scuffs up one of the symbols, if somebody breaks one of the ward posts, then there's a gap that the demons can get into. And once they do, things are done. Um, and and so uh, as a result, humanity has been hunted nearly to extinction. They live in isolated communities where people basically hand ward their own homes or they live in walled cities with big ward walls that protect them against demons. Um, and the story follows the lives of three children who each of whom are scarred by a demon encounter in their childhood that changes the course of their life into something completely other than what they expected it to be um, and gives each of them a way to fight back against the demons and hopefully help humanity claw its way back from near extinction. Um, so the books are full of adventure and monsters and action and fighting, but they're also sort of deep character studies about these pivotal people at this, you know, moment in human history where, where we're on the cusp of extinction. Great, thank you. And so related to that, as, as you've described here, uh, the world of your Demon Cycle series is incredibly complex and it's rich with details, big and small. I'd imagine that creating a fictional universe like this from the ground up has to be a really daunting task, but at the same time, it's probably a lot of fun too. Could you describe your outlining process for this series and how do you keep all those intertwining storylines and all the minute details straight across so many novels and the novellas? You know, what's interesting is that um, probably about a little over 20 years ago, uh, Wizards of the Coast put out a call to design a new fantasy world for their, as like a setting for their like next iteration of Dungeons and Dragons. And because I was such a big D&D &D fan um, and I had all of the source books and, and was a, really into that, I designed the Demon Cycle world as a, hey, you could use this world as your next D&D &D world. Um, and so I designed the monsters and the magic system and how it was all set up and submitted that as an entry in that contest like years and years ago. And nothing ever came of that. I never heard back from them. Um, they picked something else much to my chagrin. Uh, but I had built this whole world that was just waiting for stories to happen within it. And so I decided to do it on my own. And uh, from there, it was just about finding a character that would resonate with people and putting them on a path that was easy to follow and easy to understand. My goal was so that anybody could pick up the first book in the series, even if they're not a fantasy reader, and totally understand what's happening, totally understand the motivations of the characters and that it would start with very little magic and sort of ramp up as the series goes on so that by book five you can so that even my mom who doesn't read fantasy was able to pick up book one and read it and learn along the way with the characters so that by book five when people are flying and throwing lightning bolts and, and, and other crazy things uh it all makes sense because it's slowly escalated to that point no that's that's so true i'm i'm personally not usually a fantasy reader, but I've been reading uh, The Warded Man over the past week or two, and I'm just, I'm really enjoying it. So I, that kind of brings me to a question I had here is uh, a common gripe that readers sometimes express about the fantasy genre and that I've experienced myself is that sometimes the authors spend almost too much time exhaustively describing the world they created, and it can detract from the narrative. But that doesn't really seem to be a problem with your novels at all. The focus always is on the story and the characters and the pacing never lets up, despite the fact that you have, you know, unique cultures and languages and complex societies. Um, how do you achieve that balance of presenting a fleshed out fictional universe that feels authentic without bogging the reader down with too many details? Keep the story moving is my mantra. Uh, never let it get boring. Never spend too much time describing what people are wearing, describing the feast that they're eating, <laughs> describe, you know, like things that, that, a lot of other authors tend to sort of lavish prose over. Uh, I focus more on what the characters are feeling, what the characters are doing, what the characters are trying to accomplish to make their problems resonate with the reader, to make their problems feel 
like problems the reader can understand and to make those problems feel immediate so that you're following them and not the world while at the same time making the world feel so real and grounded that it's easy for the reader to extrapolate other things that are sort of happening off camera just by the details that I do present. So I sort of very carefully present what I think the reader needs to know and leave the mountain of notes that I have about other things off the page unless they have real bearing on the story. And so I have uh, like indexes of, of material for the series that no one ever sees just because there's never been a good story reason to pre present them. Okay, and so do you have, I would imagine you must have a, a good relationship with an editor, or are you pretty much on top of all these little details, or do you have an editor who's like, oh, this this isn't, uh, this doesn't jive with this other book, or anything like that? How do you, I'm just curious, I mean, it seems that has to be challenging to just keep all these little details straight across, you know, two series that take place in the same world. I, I've been creating an exhaustive series Bible for years, um, ever since the beginning. Every time I create a new person, place, or thing, I add it in there. Every time I add to the magic system, I have a, a timeline of events, all of these things in, in this very detailed file uh, that I've created that has hyperlinks so I can sort of jump around to the thing I need to find. Um, I've never really trusted anyone other than me to maintain that. Although sometimes it, you know, with my most recent book, my copy editor called me out saying that I had spelled wrong one of the made up names that I had I myself had created. So I made up a monster and uh, was spelling its name wrong because I hadn't used it in two books. And the copy editor thankfully has that sort of institutional knowledge to say, no, no, like it has to be what you did before and this is what you did before. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of times where an editor or a copy editor or a beta reader will point something out that I feel like, oh gosh, I'm glad, I'm glad somebody caught that before it came out. But for the most part, I maintain all of it. And I'm the one banging my head against the keyboard, like midway through the book, trying to make everything fit together in a way that makes sense. Uh, that, I mean, I suppose no, no one knows that world better than you, so that makes sense. <laughs> Um, we've already started to receive some questions, so I'll go ahead and get started with some of these. Um, and this is related to question I had, is that um, I heard that there was some rumblings about potentially a TV series adaptation. I'm not sure if you're at liberty to discuss that or not, but uh, if you are, we'd love to hear about it. Um, this question is, we're excited to think of films based off your series. It makes me wonder what you are most excited about the prospect and what worries you most about film or TV adaptations. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about it, and I am at liberty to talk about it, but I need to make some caveats uh, uh, in the beginning. Uh, I mean, the books have been optioned by various different directors and producers, basically since they were first published 15 years ago. Um, and we've come very close to to having a movie made. We came very close to having a, a big, massive multiplayer online game made, um, but these things can, you know, sometimes like elude you like smoke, right? When you think you're about to get them. And so I've sort of learned to not get as excited about it as I used to. Um, but all of that said, we have a director and a producer attached to the uh, property right now. Um, they have been shopping it uh, to various different uh, streaming services and um, studios and so we have a product that's ready to sell, um, but until a studio picks it up, it's just, it's just a notion. Um, so the moment that we get a green light from a, from a studio, we have a team in place to, to start making the show. And, uh, but until that happens, we're just sort of in limbo. And so that, when you add that to the, the current strikes going on in Hollywood, um, it may be some time before we hear anything. And even then there's no guarantee that it's gonna happen. Um, but I'm hopeful because my mom says the books are very good and I think <laughs> they should be. That's great. Do you, do you have any reservations about bringing this world that's been living in your head for so long to the screen? I mean, I think that when you change a, one medium to another, you have to expect there's gonna be some changes. You have to expect that 
it, movies and TV shows and books are all paced very differently. And there's a reason for that. Um, you're allowed to sprawl a little more in a TV show than you are in a movie, but still not nearly as much as you can in a book. And so you have to pick and choose what are the important things to focus on? What are the things that you can change? Like what threads can you pull at that don't unravel something else somewhere else? Um, and so, you know, there's always a concern that they'll make so many changes that it doesn't feel the way it did when, when people read the book. Um, but I can't control that. You know, all I can do is get a team that I feel really appreciates the material and respects it and wants to make a story out of it. Um, and then work with them as much as I can to try and make it into something that will resonate with my readers as well as people who've never read the books and will only be getting it through a TV show or a movie. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to make that happen, but you know, I don't control everything. And once you sign a property over to a director and a producer in a studio, they have a lot of say in what happens from that point forward. Um, it's one thing to come to them with the story, but then there's another thing for them to come back to you with a hundred million dollars to make a movie or, or whatever. Um, especially a fantasy movie with monsters and magic that would require a lot of special effects. Oh yeah. Well, we, we certainly look forward to it uh, if and when it, it comes, but uh, you know, the, the novels are there for us regardless. So we're very thankful for that. Um, received some, some more questions here. Um, so this person is wondering, or if they first wanted to make the comment that they loved reading a number of comments that you've posted throughout the years in exchanges with your readers and how you referenced being a dad in those exchanges. Um, as a father of daughters, what additional perspectives have you included in your writing since having your girls? Um, I don't know. I, I think that certainly parenthood has affected the way I look at the world and the way I look at the world certainly bleeds out into my writing in all sorts of ways. Some of them intentional and some of them not intentional. Um, the interesting thing, writing the Nightfall Saga, which is the sequel series to the Demon Cycle, uh, the first book, The Desert Prince, is on sale now. The second book, The Hidden Queen, is done and coming out in March, um, and I'm in the process of writing the third one. Uh, what's been interesting about writing that series is that series takes place 15 years later with the children of the heroes of the original series. Um, well, the children of the heroes that survived the original series. Um, and so uh, it's been a really fascinating uh, uh, exploration for me to see how, just from my own experience, kids come out so much different from how you expect them to. You know, you think when you're going to have kids that you're going to get these little clones of you, and then they come out fully loaded with their own operating system that's completely different from yours, and you just have to hold on and try and figure it out. Um, and so having kids that sort of didn't understand or didn't appreciate the legacy of their parents because they didn't live through it. Um, and seeing heroes, you know, that you've grown with and, and learned to respect struggle to connect with their kids and struggle to be good parents. You know, you might be good at saving the world, but that doesn't mean that you're, you're there for your kid all the time. Sometimes it means the exact opposite. And so how that's affected those relationships has been something that's been really interesting to study, especially as I go through it as a parent as well. Great. Um, let see, another good question here from an attendee um, about your fan base. Uh, someone saying uh, the artistic elements of your work, such as the avatars and the wards, et cetera, they seem to really resonate with your fans. And there is a great sense of community represented in your fan base, which is great. How do you stay both an inspiration for your fans and be a part of that community? Uh, I mean, it was easier when I started. Um, back in 2008, 2009, uh, Twitter was a very different place. Social media was a very different place. And uh, a lot of it was just guiding people to your own blog where you could talk endlessly. And so I, I had a lot of fan contests. I, would, I live in New York City. There, I don't have a lot of space in my apartment. And so when the publishers send me big boxes of books, I was happy to just give them all away. And so I would sign them and have contests to just to give away all, these, all of these extra books that I didn't need. And that sort of built a lot of community. There would be people who would enter every contest. I would try and make every contest different, something with a low bar of entry that anybody could participate in, 
but that left room to get really creative if you, creative if you wanted to you know like do a closet cosplay of one of the characters from the book you know or um take the magic symbols the wards and ward something in your house and take a photo of it and enter it or uh like fan art contests or like, you know, the book's about to come out. It doesn't have a cover yet, you know, draw what you think should be the cover. And um, we would get these amazing entries from people, many of whom would consistently just enter one contest after another because they enjoyed the community. They enjoyed seeing what the person that they met the last time was going to enter this time. Um, and I tried very hard to to pick a, a wide range of, of winners. You know, of course, the people that spent hours and, and a ton of money making an entry, I would always acknowledge them and hold them up and show how much I appreciated that. But also the people that just clearly made an effort or clearly like, you know, didn't have the technical art skill, but had a great idea or something to also sort of lift them up too and, and let them know that I appreciate all my readers. And so that was something that I really enjoyed doing. And, and it really built a, a community amongst my fans all around the world that uh, I cherish to this day, even though now when you try and do those things, you know, you'll put up posts on social media and, and because the algorithms have changed, like people don't see them like they used to. And so uh, it's harder to, to maintain that now than it used to be. Um, I, miss, I miss 2014 social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine in the uh, the post TikTok world, it's got to be very challenging to reach. I do your... have a TikTok? It's very funny. You should check oh, it out. Yeah. All right, check check him out on TikTok. <laughs> um, I'll get back to some of these audience questions in a moment, but I had a question for you. Um, so your books feature some really awesome action packed combat scenes, and even though these novels all take place within a fictional world, I imagine you must have done your fair share of research to be able to create such realistic feeling combat scenes. Um, what sources did you draw from for that? Uh, for one, uh, because I am a self-employed writer, I get to um, count my kickboxing instruction as a uh, business expense, which is <laughs> it's kind of awesome. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so I, I, I take kickboxing myself I've always always been a fan of like kung fu movies and action movies and fight choreography. I actually have, you know, fight choreographers that I tend to follow and um, really sort of study like those sort of detailed combat movements. I also loved reading books by authors like R.A. Salvatore, who would just write, you know, a 10 page sword fight where every swing and duck and, and parry like had you on the edge of your seat. And I always sort of admired that and look up to that and, and aspired to that as a writer as well. Um, so I don't put characters in a fight unless there's a good reason for it, a good story reason and a good emotional reason. There needs to be something at stake. There needs to be a real chance that the, that the protagonist is gonna lose. And yet uh, when I do that, it, it really, uh, I just, it's the easiest part of writing for me. It's the part where as long as it takes to read a fight scene is probably about as long as it took me to write it. Um, and I can't say that about any other type of writing. Uh, but once the fight starts, like I just, it comes alive in my head and I, I just, I'm just writing it down. Right. Well, it certainly jumps off the page. Um, so book two of your new spinoff series, the nightfall saga, which is also takes place within the same world, I believe 15 years after the events of the last book, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And um, also correct me if I'm mistaken here, but I read that that will be a trilogy, which means that you're now kind of approaching the end of this new series. Do you already yeah. have plans for what your next project will be once you conclude the book, book three? Uh, I do. Uh, it is possible that my next project may come out uh, concurrently or even before book three, um, because I have a project that I've been working on sort of on the side for years. I'll go on writing retreats with some other authors and uh, work exclusively on this new project um, and then come back to my day job of working on the, the main trilogy. Um, and so I have a, a book that's almost done that I may uh, release before the third book in the trilogy comes out. Um, 
it's definitely exciting and daunting to step into something totally new. Um, but I've been doing demon cycle stories for 15 years now, and I'm ready to, to have a bit of a change, even though I will say that uh, the hidden queen, the book that I've just finished is, is one of my favorite books that I've ever written. And I'm incredibly proud of it. Uh, but still got to look ahead. Yeah. And so this new project that you're working on, is that a start of a new series or is it a standalone novel? Uh, it will be a standalone novel, one and done, um, in a completely new fantasy world with a, a new magic system that I think will be really something people have never seen before, but something that they can easily relate to. Um, and uh, it'll have like a very fast paced, exciting story. Uh, similar to The Warded Man, it'll start with a group of children that sort of grow up over the course of the book, uh, culminating in a very exciting climax that'll have you on the edge of your seat. Um, and then it'll be done. And so the world will still be there. And I may choose to write more stories in that fantasy world later, but the story of the characters for this book will be finished at the end of that. And so people can just pick that up and read it and be done, which I think uh, is sort of a underrated pleasure in fantasy where everything tends to be a series. And, and I love series books myself and write them, uh, it's also nice sometimes to just have a one shot where you can read a really satisfying story with a beginning, middle and end in one sitting and then be done. That's exciting. Great. Uh, well, we certainly look forward to that. Um, let's see. So we have another good question here. So you've uh, you've been an outspoken D&D &D devotee, as you mentioned uh, earlier. Um, do you play a lot of role playing games and do you have a favorite? Is it is it Dungeons and Dragons or do you, do you play other tabletop games? Uh, I mean, the reality is, is, as a parent with young kids, like I don't play a lot of games right now. Um, oh. Having having uh, uh, two small kids in the house, like during the pandemic, and uh, it's very difficult to have sort of the quiet time to run a game of Dungeons and Dragons the way I used to. Um, I still will go to gaming conventions and play games there or do the occasional like streaming game, you know, for charity or something like that. Uh, and I'm still, I still absolutely love Dungeons and Dragons and recommend it as one of the best ways you can hone your storytelling skills. Um, I just don't get to do it as much as I would like to anymore. I'm hoping that as, as my kids get a little older, that'll come back. Uh, my eldest is actually going to a gaming convention with me uh, next month. And so we're, we're starting to move into the place where it can be a family thing. Uh, the six-year-old might be a while before she's, in, she's playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but I absolutely love the game. Um, I do play some other, uh, tabletop games, but for role-playing Dungeon Dragons has always been where my heart was. It was what I first started reading. I read all of the tie-in novels when I was a kid, the Dragonlance books, the Forgotten Realms books, um, and followed some of those authors, you know, the way other people follow movie stars or, or, you know, rock stars. To me, it was it was the people that wrote the novels that I loved. And so that's been where my heart is for a long time. Uh, we have a good question here from Jack. Uh, it says, your magic and martial systems and traditions build the cultures in your world so clearly. How do you navigate creating these martial systems for the various cultures within your world? Uh, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want I want to borrow enough things from real world cultures and and real world history so that the world feels like a real place so that when you read it, it, it feels like they have all the same problems that we have. And and humanity has gone through a lot of the same. Uh, uh, you know, you know, milestones uh, in the fi fictional world that, that we have in our world. So that when you encounter the characters and see what problems they have, you can relate to them. And so, but there's a fine line between that and doing something where a reader might feel like, oh, they're pointing, he's pointing at me right now, or they're pointing at this culture or, you know, and I didn't want my fictional cultures to be so rooted in our world that people would think that I'm trying to pe preach about some other uh, culture or religion or society. And so I kept it sort of, uh, I, I crib things from all sorts of different cultures in order to put together these fictional societies that, that feel real. Um, 
And so I studied uh, different great military leaders and their tactics and how they did things. Um, you know, the in the Desert Spear, the rise of Amon Jardir, a lot of that is was inspired by me reading like uh, Japanese medieval history and reading like uh, Shaka Zulu's uh, uh, Conquest of Africa in college. And so things like that were sort of jumping off places for me to build off of without trying to like make a statement about real history or anything like that. Um, and it's the same thing with the fictional cultures. I want there to be the same problems that we have, the same cultural problems that we have in our world so that I can talk about them and so that the characters can talk about them and so the readers have a chance to think about them and form their own ideas about problems of the way people have difficulty getting along for various religious, cultural, you know, gender reasons, whatever. Um, I like to touch on all those things in a way that doesn't feel like I'm preaching, that just feels like I'm presenting the problems that the world has and that the characters have to navigate and letting the reader sort of build their own feelings about that. Um, and so that's always been my approach to how I do it. This has been a long rambling answer to this question. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a complex question. I mean, I, I can't imagine trying to uh, navigate that all from scratch, but... Uh... So let's see, but before we uh, go on here, since we're about at the midway point, I did want to remind everyone that I, uh, as I said at the beginning, we have a free book giveaway. You get a signed copy here of The Great Bazaar and Brown's Gold, which is signed by Peter V. Brett here. Um, and I did a, uh, just using a random number generator here, I, I picked a winner. So Kurt, you you are now the winner of this book. You can pick it up at the, uh, at the second floor reference desk. If for whatever reason you're maybe not living local or you can't make it to the library, please let us know in the chat and I can pick someone else. Um, so let's uh, keep going here. We're getting a lot of good questions from the audience. So thank you all so much for participating here. Uh, so good question here from Francesco asking, what do you think was the breakthrough in your craft or routine that helped you get an agent and then a publisher? That's a really good question. Um, so there were, there were stages to it. Um, when I first started writing novels, um, well, I wrote a couple of novels in high school that we don't really talk about and we'll never talk about again. Um, and then, uh, the, the novels that I started writing after that in college were based on my D and D games, which I think is a very common starting point for a lot of authors. Um, the problem was that that was limiting. I was limited by the D&D &D magic system. I basically only had one publisher I could sell it to, the, the people who make D&D &D tie-in novels. And um, it was limiting in a lot of ways. I was, you know, like I had to use their map. I had to use all of their other stuff. And so the first big step towards becoming a professional author was abandoning that series which was hard for a lot of reasons. I first rewrote the whole thing to try and make it my own and change the magic system and change, you know, the the races of, you know, demi-human creatures, you know, like I, I spelled elves differently, like, like trying to find a way to differentiate it from D&D. But, but some of those problems were so rooted and systemic that the only solution was to walk away from two and a half novels worth of writing and start something fresh. And I think that that, right there is a hurdle that a lot of aspiring authors are not willing to jump. Um, walking away from something that you put a lot of effort into to start something new is really hard to do, but it's absolutely necessary because, you know, you learn a lot writing those practice books and then you need to apply it from the start in a new story if you want to do your best work. And so killing that darling, uh, was the first step, I think, into becoming a professional writer. Um, and then after that, I pitched the books to, to a very successful agent in New York City, and he read them and basically <laughs> told me, you know, like he took me out for coffee and basically said, uh, the book was a big disappointment. Uh, it was clear that I had taught myself, I was a self-taught writer and that I was making a lot of amateur mistakes, but that 
the core story was really good. And if I, you know, read a book on writing that he gave me and like looked at the story problems and, and did a rewrite that he would look at it again. And so he gave me a book called Writing to Sell by Scott Meredith. Um, it's a dated book. It was written in the 50s, but a lot of its wisdom still applies. Scott Meredith was one of the most successful literary agents at the time. And basically the book is, you know, I've packaged, you know, countless bestsellers and they all had these things in common. And the authors all had these things in common and you can do those things too. And uh, I read that book and it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And suddenly I understood story structure and I understood how to uh, uh, write a story that was true to what I wanted, but also um, was tight and fast paced and, and kept the reader interested. Um, and so I took a year and I did a complete rewrite of that book. Um, at the time I was working in Times Square and living in Brooklyn. I had about an hour subway ride each way. And so I would get on the subway uh, with my little smartphone. I mean, this was 2005. So it was a little HP smartphone with like actual buttons on it. And I would write, you know, on the way to work and on the way home, I would maybe get 600 words each day that way. And then I would do a little more writing at night. And uh, over the course of a year, I completely rewrote that first book and sent it out to my agent again, saying, will you take a look at it now? And at that point, you know, I had abandoned my original series. I had written this whole other book and then thrown out 60% of it and rewritten it pretty much from scratch. And so I sent the book in and I remember thinking to myself, you know, if this doesn't work out, maybe this writing thing just isn't for me. Um, but uh, very soon afterward, I got a phone call and I remember I was at work at the time. I got a phone call from the agent saying, uh, this is the best book I've read this year. I can't wait to take it to market. And uh, within a couple of months, we not only had the book sold in the United States, but it had sold in uh, France and the UK and Germany. And suddenly this little hobby that I like to do, you know, at the end of the workday or, or on the subway, uh, became my real job and uh, been doing it ever since. Wow. That's, what an undertaking to have to rewrite so much of it from scratch, but uh, that's great that it all worked out. Um, this is the, the humility top... that you need. I think if you want, if you really want to be a writer, if you're really aspiring to be a writer, you have to have the humility to say like, I can always write something better and be willing to, to, take the sunk cost of things that you write that don't get published to get you to the place where you're writing at a professional level. Yeah, I was going to say I was, a, I was a music major prior to becoming a librarian. And one thing that the music instructors always said is leave your ego at the door. It sounds like that's a, that also works with writers as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is that there's countless ways to write well. There are people whose prose is so beautiful that I read it and I think I could never write pro prose this beautiful. And there are people that, you know, can describe a feast scene in a way that makes you so hungry. And like, all you can think about is this fictional food and how delicious it must be. And there are people who can write, you know, compelling romance that affects you even if the rest of the story is weak. Um, there's so many ways to write well, and you don't have to be able to do all of them. You just have to write well in the way that you write um, and be humble enough to know that you can keep improving and that there will always be people who do it better than you. And you, sh you should aspire to that rather than resent it. Absolutely. And uh, so you mentioned how in this process, you were, you were writing on your phone back and forth to work. Now that you are settled into being a professional writer for many years, what does your writing routine look like? Are you the sort of writer who, who goes into his office at a particular time and you know writes a certain number of words or does it vary from day to day? You know, I had an office and then I had a kid who made that office into their room. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it, I, I, I always want to have that sort of ritualized structure of like, I write between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. every day. Um, and sometimes during the school year or something, when, when hours with the kids are consistent, um, sometimes I achieve that for a while. But the reality is that I tend to just 
steal time wherever I can get it. So if I'm on the subway going somewhere, I'm writing. If I have, you know, a few hours to go to the park, maybe I can go out and get some writing done. If the house is empty for an hour unexpectedly because, you know, my partner took uh, the kids out, then I'll, I'll get in a quick burst of writing there. Sometimes I'll stay up late after everyone's gone to sleep and work. Um, the novel that I wrote during the pandemic, The Desert Prince, was written mostly between the hours of 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. after all the other kids had gone to sleep. Uh, because during the pandemic, the house was full and there was just no writing to get done during the day. And so that's another thing where if, if being a writer is important to you, you have to make the time, you have to find the time. Um, when I was aspiring, uh, the time was on the subway. Like I gave up my reading time. I would usually read books on the subway and it hurt to give that up, but I needed to find the time somewhere. And that was where I could make time without causing too big of a ripple in the rest of my life. And I think everybody has periods of time you can steal like that. And if you train yourself to, to work that way, you'll find that you can be creative pretty much on command whenever you have a few moments to steal. And if you build a head of steam where your mind is in the world that you're writing and in the story that you're writing, um, you're writing little bits in your head all the time. And if you can just grab a moment here and there to jot them down, every word counts. Every word, you know, gets you closer to a finished story. And so uh, we all have our own ways of doing it, but I have tended to just steal time wherever yeah. I can find it. I've never felt at any time in my life that I had enough time to write. You just have to make it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that actually brings me to my question. Um, now that you're, you know, not only are you uh, a father of, of young kids, but you're also a professional novelist. Do you ever find time now to do reading for pleasure? A little bit sometimes. Um, so most of my reading now has become audiobooks when I'm at the gym or when I'm taking a walk or something like that. That's, uh, you know, I, I have a six-year-old who will not let me sit down and read a book. And so the only hours that I can read are, are when they're out of the house or asleep. Um, so when we go on vacation, sometimes I'll bring a couple of books and read a couple of books while we're on vacation. Um, and I will listen to audiobooks whenever I can to catch up. But uh, most of the reading that I get asked to do, you know, from publishers that are looking for book blurbs, uh, by the time it's on audio, it's too late to give a blurb. Um, and so they send you a lot of paper books and I have a lot of guilt looking at that pile and I get to as many as I can, but uh, I won't blurb a book unless I've actually read it. And it's hard right now to find that leisure time. Again, I think once, uh, once my kid's a little older, it'll probably get easier. Once she can read on her own, I think our whole, our whole relationship is gonna change. <laughs> I'm like, well, um, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you aren't giving uh, book blurbs under false pretenses. I always wonder when I see those from these really big best-selling authors. Like, do they really have time to read that whole book? <laughs> I mean, you know, and it, and you know, there was a recent article about it. Um, just came out a day or two ago. I, I'm pretty sure I tweeted it. If anyone wants to find it, um, that talked about the book blurb industry and how publishing has sort of painted itself into a corner with it, where we. we we need it because it's our primary way of letting people know that people are excited about a book, but it's almost impossible to function because nobody can read all of those books. It's not possible. Um, so even the publishers who are promoting a book, most of their people haven't actually read it and they rely on blurbs to build excitement. Um, and so that, look, there are some authors who will give a positive blurb to somebody who, who's a friend or, or, or for various other reasons, even if they haven't read the book. Um, and there are some authors who won't. And I've always tried to, to be really honest. And sometimes I'll, I'll even say up front, like, hey, I know this author, like, and they've, we've talked about their books quite a bit, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, but I still think that it's worth it. Um, and other times, I'll read a book and I'll give an honest impression. I'll, I'll say to the author, like, look, you know, I thought it was okay. Uh, I, I'd, I'd rather not say anything at all than, than say that I thought it was okay. Um, 
And then, but then on the occasions when I find a book that I love, I want people to know about it. I want people to know that I'm excited about it. And so if I promote a book, you can trust that I read it and that I am being honest in whatever it is I'm saying about it. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, so we have a, a question and comment here from Berta who says, they are too tired to formulate a decent question. Well, we appreciate you <laughs> coming in and logging in and spending your evening with us regardless. Um, so it's got to be 3 a.m. Um, oh, well. <laughs> oh, is, is that the, the person logging in from? Yeah, uh, Ber Berta is either in Germany or in the UK right now. I'm not sure. So uh, Berta is one of uh, those fans who would join every fan contest and who I appreciate so much as a result. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm shocked that you're awake right now. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to log in. Uh, they had a question asking, uh, what's your favorite scene from each book and why? Maybe I won't say each book, but do you have a a, a favorite scene from any of your books that like really just pops in your mind? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. I, you know, it's interesting. The there are so many scenes of like triumphant action or like you know like. Uh, critical character development or whatever, but my favorite scene in the entire Demon Cycle series uh, occurs in the third book and it's a wedding scene. And it's just like two characters sort of realize that they've bitten off more, they, more than they can chew and there's a big battle coming up and they decide they're gonna just get married with no plans whatsoever. They're just gonna wing it one night. Um, and the whole town kind of drops whatever they're doing to come together to form this makeshift party to celebrate them uh just at the drop of a hat and even now like years later like like i wrote that scene 10 years ago if i have to reread it because i'm trying to brush up on something or if i'm listening to the audiobook uh i still get choked up about it um just because it like it's nice to have moments of sort of human goodness uh because that's a real thing and it's easy to forget that that's a real thing. And so that, that scene always, uh, always touches me whenever I look at it again. Right. Um, so you mentioned earlier how you, when you first got started writing that you would write comic books and I know you've gone on record saying that you own more than a thousand comics, I believe. I can see some of more them. 10,000 really. <laughs> um, and so about a decade ago, I know you also, uh, you wrote one of the, uh, a book in the Red Sonia comic book series from Dynamite Comics. Do you ever see yourself returning to the world of comic books? I mean, I love comic books. Um, to this day, uh, I still read them. Um, I'm actually, comic books are something you can read in very sh short sittings. And so I still tend to read some comics. Um, and I really enjoyed writing them, although it was a very different skill set from writing novels. You know, I sort of, had been talking to the um, Dynamite Comics uh, just as an aside at, at Comic-Con. And I mentioned that, oh, I like that you relaunched Red Sonja. I used to read that when I was a kid back in the eighties. And I was talking to them about the history of the character and what I loved about it in the eighties. Um, and they were like, oh, we've got to get you to, to write a book for us. And so in my arrogance, I was like, oh, sure. I've read thousands of comic books. How hard could that be? I'll, I'll write a comic book. It's a tiny fraction of the writing that I do for a novel. Um, and then I went in to do it and realized that it was an entirely different skill set that I didn't have and that I had to sort of reinvent the wheel and learn how to write a script and learn how to write uh, in that format and stop writing long soliloquies for characters that needed to be fit into a tiny word bubble. Um, and so by the end of it, I, I, I had sort of gotten a lot better at it and i'm really proud of the results um but the thing that was hardest about it for me was playing in somebody else's sandbox anytime you want red sonya to do something you need the people who own the you know the robert e howard estate or whatever to approve it and so i would come up with story ideas and i would send them out and wait and get a lot of have a lot of them get rejected and um, the nice thing about working in a world that you created yourself and own yourself is that you can do whatever you want without waiting for permission. And so I think if I went back to comics, it would be, it would have to be something that I created myself and had a lot of freedom with rather than writing Spider-Man or something, which I might love, but I would be much more constricted in what I was able to do. 
Uh, that, that makes sense. Um, we received a few more good questions here. Um, Carrie's asking, um, what was your inspiration around Olive? Did modern social justice movements help inspire you for the character? Okay, so this is a reference to the Nightfall Saga, um, which is the sequel series to the Demon Cycle. Um, in the fifth, this is gonna be some, there's gonna be some spoilers here. Uh, they will be minor in terms of the story, but they're necessary for this conversation. Um, at the end of the fifth book in the Demon Cycle series, um, there is a character birth and the character Olive is born intersex. Um, and that grew out of a lot of things. Um, my desire to tell a story with an intersex protagonist sort of came out of, over the course of writing the original series, I had this goal to keep a gender balance throughout the entire series. So there are um, 12 human protagonists over the course of the series, like 12 POV characters, and six of them are men and six of them are women. And in addition to that, I've always tried to have a 50-50 gender balance throughout the entire series in the way that the real world is, is balanced. So, uh, you know, throughout human history, women have own businesses and, you know, been leaders in their communities and you run, you know, sat on thrones and uh, fought in wars. And so I wanted my series to really reflect that. Um, some of that was from a conversation that I had with Robert Jordan, who wrote the Wheel of Time series, um, where he told me, like, it's not enough to have a female protagonist. You have to have half of the wagon drivers be female. You have to have half of the, you know, farmhands be, be women. You have to have, you know, like the, the person in the background turning knobs on the Enterprise bridge. Half of them need to be women. If you really want your books to look like the real world looks, you have to do that throughout. You can't just have it be the title characters. And so that was something that I worked very hard to have that balance in the original series. Um, and that brought up a lot of questions for me about gender and about uh, where the line is between the physical differences in gender and where the line is between how the social structures we've created treat different genders. And so I wanted to explore those questions and I wanted to do it in a way that the reader could really relate to it and sort of understand uh, what the character was going to through. And so I created Olive Paper who is intersex um, and basically has a choice of what gender they wanna be because they uh, could fit in in either place. Uh, and so it becomes more, who do I want to be and why, rather than what is society forcing me to be? And that was a, an interesting exploration. And so I, I put those books in um, first person for a lot of reasons, because I think it's sort of closer to a character's emotional state, but also because it avoids pronouns. You say I instead of using pronouns, because I think that that's where a lot of people get tripped up about gender issues, you know, like the moment it becomes about pronouns, it gets politicized when the reality is everybody struggles with what's expected of them because of their gender. And these are questions that we can all relate to and all think about. And so I wanted to tell a story that explores that. Um, so the two characters in the demons in the Nightfall Saga Olive Paper uh, is born intersex, and then Darren Bales, the other protagonist, uh, is autistic. He is born with supernatural powers that give him senses beyond what normal humans have, but those senses give him so much input that his brain can't keep up with all of it. And so he'll be trying to have a conversation with someone, and he'll be getting all of this input about he can smell what they had for breakfast and he knows where they, you know, where they've been from the dirt on their shoes. And like, he can hear their heart beating and he knows when they're lying and he can smell their sweat and he can smell their tears. And, and so they're having a very straightforward conversation with him, but he's trying to process all of this other stuff and it makes him sort of out of sync with other people. Um, and so these are ways I think that in a fantasy story, you can, you have the room to explore real world things in a way that's separated enough that people don't feel like you're pointing right at them 
and are more open-minded and willing to, to go with that. Um, and so that was really important to me in writing the series. Uh, it talks about a lot of things that I want to talk about, but it doesn't in a, in a way that I think uh, all of my readers can enjoy because uh, for, for better or for worse, I have a, readers across the political spectrum. Uh, and I like to keep it that way by telling what I think are honest stories that focus in on real people and what their problems are that anyone can relate to. And then you can take away from that story whatever you want. Great. Uh, looks like we're starting to run out of time. Hopefully we can get to at least one more here. Um, another good audience question from Kelsey saying, my partner, roommate, and I really love your writing. We were wondering, do you have a favorite character? Uh, my favorite character is Alona Paper. Um, she is the mother of one of the main characters. And uh, every time she comes on the scene, she completely takes over. Um, I, I have to use her very sparingly as a character because the moment she walks on set, she completely takes over the scene. Um, but I also just, I love writing her. I think readers love hating her. <laughs> and because she's, she's a woman who uh, is so self-centered that she will just come out and slap everyone across the face with the truth about a lot of things uh, and not care about their feelings. And it, it lets conversations quickly get to the, the, the root of what people are dancing around uh, much more directly. And so it just, uh, it's so enjoyable to write and so enjoyable to hate. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, so maybe we'll, we'll end with this one here. So uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, your uh, book two of the Nightfall Saga, The Hidden Queen is coming out early next year. Um, so without giving too much away for those who may not have read book one yet, um, what can you tell us about your forthcoming entry in the series? Um, so the first book, The Desert Prince, focused more on Olive Paper and um, her story and her exploration of uh, the legacy that she's been left by her parents and also uh, who she wants to be as a person. Um, and the second book focuses more on Darren Bales, uh, the character I was just talking about, and his, uh, someone close to him has been kidnapped. And even though he struggles just doing day-to-day -day things in a lot of ways, he's so determined to rescue her that he's willing to do anything. And so, uh, the story focuses a lot more on Darren and uh, his struggles, but also his strengths and the ways that his powers uh, for all the drawbacks they give him in his personal life and his social life can also make him capable of incredible things. And so it's a story of courage and found family. And uh, I'm incredibly proud of it. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written and I can't wait to be able to share it with people. Uh, it's really hard for writers you know, readers always talk about the wait for the next book, but it's hard for a writer too. When when you've done the when your work is done, you've turned it into the publisher, but there's still physical logistics of printing the books and shipping them and doing design that makes it months and months before people can actually read the thing that you've write, you've written. So I'm I'm chomping at the bit for people to read it too because I think it's going to really be something special. Awesome. Well, it's unfortunately we've run out of time here, um, but it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I really can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to zoom in from across the country here and chat with our community. Um, also, just want to say thank you to everyone in attendance for asking such good questions and participating. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to say to our community here before we wrap up? Uh, I just, I really appreciate being invited to come on uh your science fiction September uh, line of events. This has been uh, great. And I'm, I really appreciate everyone who logged in and who's listened and has given such thoughtful questions. Um, it's enjoyable to do that. Uh, I'm hoping that I'll be on book tour again in the spring when the new book comes out. So uh, if that happens, I'll be able to visit a lot of uh, people around the world that I haven't seen since before the pandemic, when, when book tours were sort of uh, 
fell off the rails. Um, <laughs> so look forward to that. Um, and also that uh, Delray Books has been re-releasing the original Demon Cycle. Uh, they're putting out one book in trade paper paperback every couple of months leading up to the release of the new novel in March. And so if you're new to the series, uh, there's beautiful brand new pa large paperback editions coming out uh, that include uh, bonus materials that weren't in the original books. Great, that's exciting. All right, well, I won't keep you any longer. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Peter. And uh, thank you to everyone who came. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.